So in chapter 7, right after the, the call narrative, we get one of Isaiah's most famous uh, prophecies, which most of us know now simply by the name Emmanuel. Uh, huge implications, obviously, for Christian interpretation. But also, in the book, an incredibly specific historical context for, for, this, uh, for this prophecy. Uh, we mentioned in the first section uh, the Syro-Ephraimite War. Most people are never going to have heard of what this, this thing was. OK, so the situation is this. It's in the 730s. It's the year 733 BC. Um, Assyria is threatening to swallow up all the little states over towards the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So the people of Syria in the capital of Damascus, and Ephraim is a name for northern Israel. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's Damascus and Samaria uh, form an alliance. So the Arameans, really, and the Israelites. Yes. The northern Israelites. And then they want to persuade the king of Judah to join them. And he doesn't want to, for very good reasons. He knows <laughs> how this is going to go. Right. And it's, it's a suicidal act. To, to try to withstand uh, Assyria. So that's the situation here. And um, he, the king, when we meet him here, is out uh, at the end of the conduit of the upper field. And this is Ahaz. This is Ahaz. And the prophet comes along with his son, Sha'ar Yashuv. Sha'ar Yashuv means a remnant shall return. Yeah. Isaiah, Isaiah's kids have unusually message full names. <laughs> They're walking billboards. They are. <laughs> uh, now, there, it's not as bad, actually, as the children of Hosea, who was a contemporary of his. Right. Hosea actually calls one of his children not loved, <laughs> and another one not my people, yeah. sure to make them popular on the playground. <laughs> uh, so, but, but evidently, already at this point, uh, Isaiah is preaching, a remnant shall return. Right. Now, is that good news or bad news? Uh, it's good news for <laughs> nobody except the remnant. <laughs> That's right. You see, if you're in a situation where nobody has left, nobody has been deported, it's bad news. Yes, for it's sure. It's saying only a remnant shall return. Mm -hmm. After the majority are deported, well, then, then it's, there's some consolation in it. Yeah. But it's a very qualified consolation. And do you, there's a do you tendency to make Isaiah into a prophet of hope, and it's very qualified hope. Yeah, do you think, just as an aside, do you yeah. think that the fact that he's already talking about a remnant returning suggests that this may have been written or somehow added after there was actually an exile? Because there's a tendency for people to say, every time I see a reference to the exile, that must have been from after the fact. Well. You know, on any reckoning, there already had been some Assyrian deportations mm -hmm. uh, in 738. Right. So five years before this. So that the idea of people being deported was very much on the table. Right. And was, and of course, the most terrifying thing that anybody could imagine, right? This is in this time and place. Still yeah. Very much attachment to the land. Right, the notion that God gave us this land and uh, being removed from it was about the worst possible, worst possible fate. So, okay, yeah. back, to, back to our, our prophecy. Yeah. So what makes this chapter famous yeah. is that uh, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, that's Isaiah spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord. And Ahaz says, I will not, I will not tempt the Lord. And Isaiah said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you must also weary my God? The Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, I'm reading from the NRSV. The young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. Now, uh, the traditional translation in, certainly in the Latin, the Greek also I really think it goes is back to the Greek, yep. uh, is a virgin shall concede. And so in the New Testament, this is taken as the proof text for the virgin birth. Right. In fact, it's probably from this verse that the whole idea of a virgin birth comes, arguably. Uh, when the 
original RSV was published, there were book burnings because they didn't translate it a virgin. And my guess no. is most <coughs> modern translations don't. I think that the, the Jewish publication translation also says young woman. The Hebrew word? Almana, yeah. right? There is a Hebrew word uh, yeah. for virgin. Uh, yeah, which is betula. Which and, and the late Harry Erlinsky, a great Jewish scholar who was on the original RSV committee, uh, made that argument. If he had wanted to say a virgin, they would have said They've, they've got a perfectly good word for it. So uh, an Alma is a young woman of marriageable age. Yep. And such a person might be a virgin, but if she's going to have a child, she probably isn't. Well, right. Uh, it's a... Uh, you know, it's hard to know, right? It's, it's, yes. it's not, it's really, the word isn't about that status, right? right. It's, uh, it's, about, it's about your status relative to marriage more than it is uh, relative to virginity. Now, who is this young woman? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's safe to say, certainly within the context of, uh, of the story, uh, it's not Mary. Uh, and it, it, it's safe it, it, to say it has to be somebody who was alive at the time. Right. I mean, this is the thing, right? When we think about it, about the traditional Christian interpretation of this verse, it, the verse is removed entirely from the context of the story That's itself, right. be, which is the interpretive style of that time, right? That's how both uh, early Jews and early Christians interpreted, was you sort of took the verse as the, as the unit of interpretation. See, it's it God imparting information that may be useful a couple of hundred years from now. Right, but you have to, you have to sort of, you have to take it out of its, its uh, narrative and historical yeah. context, because within its context, of course, uh, it does, if Ahaz is being given a sign as to whether or not he should go to war, it's not useful for that sign to come 700 years later. I think it's safe to say. So the identity of the woman mm. in the time of the story, I don't know if we can say for well, sure. It if, may be Isaiah's There, there are really wife. only two, <laughs> two possibilities, it seems to be. One of them is the wife of Isaiah. Uh -huh. And we know that he has a tendency to give his kids symbolic names. Mm -hmm. There is that much to it. The other one is that it's the wife of the king, which would be a much more pointed sign, I think, to the king. Sure. It would be much more meaningful to the king because, you know, what, what does it mean in a case like that? Well, it means life is going to go on here. Right. You're having a child. There is a future. Right. And this is, and this is to, be, uh, to be fair, this is the traditional Jewish interpretation, is that this is about Hezekiah. Yeah, that's who that's who this is about, we, that, and that's uh, I think a very plausible uh, interpretation. One of the problems with it is that we're not too sure exactly when Hezekiah was born, so whether it's specifically Hezekiah or not, I think is a little bit up for grabs. In but a sense, by trying I to do. figure out who it is, are we missing the point? <laughs> well, I don't think so, because you see, also the name that's given, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. is the slogan of the Davidic house, you might say, mm -hmm. that God is with us. You'll get this in the Psalms, get it, say, Psalm 46, mm -hmm. the uh, talking about Jerusalem. God is in that city. Right. God is with us. And so I think telling the king that he should name his son Emmanuel, which apparently he didn't do <laughs> later on, but, but still is telling him you should believe in your own propaganda. Right. You should and, trust. And of course, it's telling that he, yeah. the, the address here is not O Ahaz, but right, House of David, yeah. right, is, is, the pro, is the addressee right. of the prophecy. Because also, if, uh, for the House of David to survive doesn't necessarily require Ahaz to survive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nor, it, nor even for the rest of the, for the majority of the, of the nation of to survive, nation. right? You just, need, uh, you just need a remnant, right? That's right. Now, it says, curds and honey he will eat. Now, why will he eat curds and honey? Is that the kind of thing you would feed a royal child? 
probably not. It's a little shepherdy. It's a little bit shepherdy, <laughs> and actually it's mentioned again a little bit further down in the chapter in verse 21. On that day, one will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, mm -hmm. and will eat curds because of the abundance of milk that they give. For every one that is left in the land shall eat curds and honey. In other words, it's all you'll have. Mm -hmm. What you will not have is vegetables, meat. <laughs> you just won't have enough. Right. So, you know, back when Joshua sent spies into the land, they found a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, now it's curdled a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not quite as, as uh, utopian. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, uh, that's how I take this, is that he's saying, you're in for some really tough years. Right. Reduced. You just, severely, but, severely but reduced. you will survive. I mean, the line, the house will survive. Yeah. And that's what, because the child, I think, has to be a positive sign. This is, uh, it would be unnatural to give the birth of a child a negative sense. That doesn't presage total destruction. Sure. But at the same time, you know, it's not going to be an easy let off. Right. And that's, I think, the mistake a lot of people make in, uh, in reading this. Right, it's, it's about, <coughs> Emmanuel is about relying yeah. on the deity even when things are hard. Yeah. Right, uh, you know, even as the impending destruction, even as the north is wiped away to come, uh, even as we are reduced to a, to a remnant, right, this is when we, we need to, that's exactly when you need to rely on the deity as opposed to, and this is an Isaiah message throughout, as opposed to relying on uh, other nations around, right? Not in this case, don't rely yeah. on the north. Uh, later on, don't rely on Egypt. This is part of, part of Isaiah's consistent message. In the following chapter, I, I just fell across the page here on a passage. Band together, you peoples, and be dismayed. Listen, all you far countries. Take counsel together, but it shall be brought to naught. To speak a word, but it shall not stand, for God is with us. Now, so having God with us is a mixed blessing. Indeed. In a way. What is he telling Ahaz to do? Sit tight. Sit tight. He says, if you do not believe uh, or trust, whichever way you translate that word, yeah. uh, then you will not be made firm. Right. So, you see, he doesn't... Uh, we, we should probably talk at some point about the, the kind of mythology that's underlying both the Davidic house and Zion and Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. And this is the trust that God has chosen the Davidic house, has chosen Mount Zion for the king and his followers. This is a great assurance, something that means they can be self-confident. Mm -hmm. For Isaiah, it's not quite that, but at the same time, he doesn't deny it. And what he's challenging him to do is, you profess this, believe it. Mm -hmm. Which is not an easy thing to do if you're sitting in Jerusalem and you see the Assyrians coming. 